Greetings, everyone, and Happy New Year. We are so glad that you could join us tonight. Uh, we have a really exciting program this evening and uh, have several CF Foundation leaders who are going to share insights about our progress and, and look, look at some of the goals that we have ahead. So uh, excited to be together. We also have some time to take some questions later on in the program. So if you have a question, please use that Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen so we make sure we get those so we can get those later on. I also see that so many of you have also found the chat function. We'd love to see your uh, your comments in the chat. A great member of our team, Laurent Kino, is moderating the chat tonight. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, I want to start tonight by first looking back some and sharing some highlights from 2023. And, but then we'll quickly move to talking about the upcoming year and uh, some of our highest strategic priorities for 2024 in those areas that we all know as Cure, Care, and Community, the three Cs. So certainly one of the highlights of 2023 that you may know is that more people with CF have been able to start and benefit from those transformative effects of those drugs we call the CFTR modulators, right? Specifically Trikafta, which can treat about 90% of people with CF, which was approved in 2023 down to the age of two years. And Kaleidico, the original CFTR modulator for a smaller group of people with CF um, that became available all the way down to, the, to those at one month of age, right? So this is all part of that vision to treat CF earlier and earlier and hopefully prevent many of the problems that we classically associate with CF. Now, to continue to increase the impact of those CFTR modulators, we also grew our research portfolio to potential new modulators in 2023 and conducted some late stage clinical trials that will lead to the next generation of CFTR modulators beyond Trikafta. So stay tuned for that in 2024, as well as we'll talk about that some more tonight. Um, of course, we uh, always follow that discussion with recognizing that not everyone with CF can benefit from modulators, right? So in 2023, a lot of our efforts went into moving full speed ahead to develop transformative treatments for all people with CF no matter what CF mutations they have, and to really lay the groundwork for actually curing cystic fibrosis. So this has meant advancing our path to a cure initiative, right? Funding, actually at this point, more than 50 different research programs with leading and emerging biotech companies to make sure we get the world's best science to be applied to cystic fibrosis. And so in this area, did you see the news this morning? I hope you did. We just announced this morning a new $15 million collaboration with Prime Medicine to pursue gene editing technology for CF. Now, this is something we've been working on, truthfully, for more than a year, getting this collaboration ready. And it represents one of the foundation's largest direct investments in gene editing, and with a company really known for their cutting edge science. So we couldn't be more excited about this, what it could mean for CF in the future. And uh, we'll definitely talk some more about this later on tonight. Um, also in 2023, did you know that we celebrated an important anniversary? So most of you know that the foundation supports the world's largest CF clinical trial network called the Therapeutics Development Network or TDN. Uh, last year, the TDN celebrated its 25th anniversary. And to date, that TDN clinical trial network has conducted more than 150 clinical trials to speed up the delivery of new and better treatments, including those modulator trials I just mentioned earlier. So I wanna say thank you to everyone who's participated in those trials. Keep up the good work. We're going to need you to continue to push our progress forward. Um, now, in terms of care across the country, as multidisciplinary teams have continued to really work to respond to the changing care needs um, in all our 130 accredited CF care centers. And in 2023, we actually started a group that's reviewing and tailoring those care recommendations as we look forward. So more on that. We'll talk about that tonight. And of course, in 2023, we continued to collaborate with and serve the CF community. And part of this was advancing, uh, really working to advance health equity. And that included recommendations to make sure we can help all people with CF develop a roadmap to guide those efforts. That included addressing delays in diagnosis and treatment of rare mutations, and it also included access issues, particularly improving access to CF treatments by advocating with state and federal policymakers and insurance providers and other decision makers to make sure our community needs and priorities are heard. So thank you. I know so many people helped with this. You are definitely making a difference. Uh, we're really uh, grateful for that. 
And then I also just want to say how grateful we are for the many generous volunteers and donors that raised close to $90 million this year. Uh, these funds are absolutely essential to our being able to continue to aggressively push ahead in all of these areas. And I want to call out uh, two in particular to recognize our 2024 national corporate champions. And so these companies together raised a little short of $10 million this past year. So a special thank you to our platinum national corporate champion, American Airlines. Uh, for nearly 40 years, they've given us amazing support. We've all seen that. And also to Choate Construction, our gold national corporate champion, who continues to engage both their corporate and their family networks to raise funds through their famous Cars and Q for the cause. And that's Q as in barbecue, in case you didn't know. So looking forward, a lot in 2023, but a lot of momentum as we head into 2024. So uh, before we start talking to the panel, sort of diving in on that, I just want to talk to you about what I see as some of our top priorities for 2024. And our goal tonight in all of this is not just to provide a list of the things that we're working on, but I really would love to be able to share with you the strategy behind the approaches so we can sort of all understand the why about uh, the approaches that we're taking. So uh, look for that sort of that strategy part. For instance, in Cure, as we head into 2024, you know we're absolutely committed to developing genetic therapies that will benefit all people with CF and lay the groundwork for a cure, right? One of the things in 2024 is that we're really doubling down our efforts to make sure we build an ecosystem that allows companies to efficiently and rapidly develop those genetic therapies. And so I'll just I'll go through a couple of the, the things in that ecosystem. A key part of that's our basic science lab in Boston, where we have nearly 50 scientists working both on their own genetic therapy research and working closely with companies to bolster and test their emerging research. The lab is one core element of this ecosystem, the early part, and more important than ever because of their expertise in genetic therapies. Um, tonight, we're going to discuss another key element of the CF drug development ecosystem, that is the TDN and the clinical trials that they conduct. Uh, the foundation is exploring new clinical trial designs for small numbers of people with CF who do not benefit from CFTR modulators. And this is going to be important as we think about ways to accelerate the approval process for the genetic therapies of the future. And then 2024 in care, part of our strategy is really thinking, how can we best tailor care to the different journeys of uh, the people with CF are having today, right? So we know that about 60% of people with CF are adults. Many are benefiting from modulators. Some are feeling healthier and say, hey, I don't need to be seen quite as much. Uh, others though, the CF experience hasn't changed. We also know that the advanced lung disease and other serious health challenges caused by CF remain a, re a reality for so many. So we know those CF care models need to evolve. Um, we're continuing to think about, okay, how can we meet people where they are on their journey and to continue to provide the high quality specialized care that works. You'll read more or you'll hear more about that later on. So, and then finally that other C community, we just remain deeply committed to making sure that it's easier to live with CF. And so what does that mean? We wanna advocate at the state and federal level. We wanna hold insurers accountable. We wanna support people with CF through information and resources. And I can tell you that everyone at the foundation has passion and a sense of urgency in pushing all of this work forward in the year ahead. And I think you're gonna feel that when you talk to some of our, our leaders uh, tonight. But before we move to hearing from them, I, let's hear from a just as important group, and that's you. So here's what several community members said they're excited about as they look forward to the year ahead. More travel adventures. I'm excited to grow in my career as a computer programmer and also to further develop my skills as a landscape photographer. Hi, we're the Quaintance family. And we're excited for... Modulators! Especially for the rare mutations. I'm excited to attend my son's white coat ceremony, marking his third year as a dental student. Because of the CF Foundation and the incredible research it has funded, my son is living the life he's always envisioned for himself, transforming his life from once being a patient into becoming a doctor himself. I'm excited about the promise that genetic therapies bring to everyone with CF. I'm most excited about being able to breathe and being alive and to take wonderful winter hikes. I'm excited for the birth of our first little baby. I'm excited that my 39-year-old daughter is able to return to her profession as a speech and language pathologist after nine years on disability. 
Trikapta has stabilized her health enough for her to return to work, and I'm so excited to watch her thrive in 2024. I'm excited to spend more time with my friends and family and more time doing things outdoors. I'm excited that my son is turning 20 years old this year and that he's happy, healthy, and thriving. I am excited that the life expectancy for those with CF continues to increase every year. Hello. 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 We're the Medrano family, and this is Javier, our CF warrior. We live in Washington State. The reason we're most excited for 2024 is to be able to attend the Volunteer Leadership Conference in Washington, D.C., and to be part of the March on the Hill to represent my son and others with cystic fibrosis. Hello, my name is Juan Javier. Um, I'm excited to go to Disney World for this year. Bye. Bye. Well, that was great. Uh, thank you to our team for putting that together. We may have to have one year where we just do that for the whole time. That was fantastic. Um, so talking about what's exciting ahead, let's move to our panel conversation now. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have a question or a comment, please send it our way through the Q&A uh, box. Uh, we're going to try to address as many of those as we can. And uh, I want to welcome our distinguished panelists, who I'm so grateful to have on our CFF team. And those uh, leaders tonight include Dr. J.P. Clancy, our Senior Vice President of Clinical Research, uh, Mary Dwight, our Chief Policy and Advocacy Officer, and Dr. Al Faro, our Vice President of Clinical Affairs. And so thank you, JP, Mary, Al, thank you for joining us. Are you guys ready? We're ready. Ah, that's perfect. Um, so uh, we're going to, rather than just jumping all over the place, JP, we're going to start with you, stick with you for a little bit and sort of move around the circle here. So um, JP, let's start by looking back and sort of hold, hold ourselves accountable here, right? And looking back sort of a year ago when we talked about this, what were we excited about? How'd we do? Uh, so yeah, fill us in a little bit as we look back and, and how we did. Yeah, it sounds great. And it's so good to see everybody here today. And I love seeing all the chat and uh, trying to keep up with it. That's that's the challenge. Um, so when we met last year, um, I was really excited about the beginning of clinical trials um, for genetic-based therapies. And uh, happy to say there's been a lot of progress on that front. And let me, I can walk through a few things. Um, but first, why, why are genetic therapy trials important? Um, well, these are the clearest path to provide CFTR treatments for people who, don't, who aren't able to take CFTR modulators. And ultimately that's our path to a cure for everybody with CF. So that's why we think of these as so important. Um, since last year, we've seen a lot of progress in early phase trials across three different fronts, uh, RNA, DNA, and ASOs, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Starting with RNA, we already have two companies who are enrolling people with CF right now in clinical trials, and a third is almost in the clinic. Now, mRNA, it's not really a, a someday thing. I mean, since most COVID vaccines are actually RNA therapies, um, but we're trying to adapt that technology to CF by, and actually inhale the RNA and then give back a work. Mm -hmm. CFTR. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the uh, companies that is working in the CF space, you may have heard of, his name is Moderna. They are partnered with one of the companies that's actually developing CFRNA. So a lot of excitement there, as you can guess. Uh, for DNA, uh, a little different, that's actually formally gene therapy. There are three companies who've already brought protocols for review to the research network, the TDN. And one of these companies, 4D Molecular, has actually reported evidence of gene transfer to airway cells of people who've been dosed with their drug. Um, on the next front, ASOs, these are called, these are like short little nucleotides that benefit people who have kind of select splice mutations. One approach has already completed their studies in healthy volunteers and are getting, are, are gearing up to start their studies in people with CF. And I also wanted to pick up on what you mentioned earlier, Mike, um, just how excited we are about the announcement from earlier today about the CF Foundation committing up to $15 million to a company called Prime Medicine. This is for lab work that's using a new gene editing technology that's called Prime Editing. And this technology is really exciting because it can actually produce very small or actually very large fixes in DNA at precise sites. Um, it's still a ways away from being in clinical trials, but it's a really excited, exciting approach, and we think it could apply to almost every person with CF. 
And now I know it's impossible to say, everybody's going to ask, when are these going to be here? When are we going to have them in, in the clinic? Um, it's kind of hard to say. Um, these you know programs kind of go at uh, the, the pace they do. Right now, we're very much in the safety and tolerability phase. Um, and so it's a little hard to know exactly when we'll have FDA approved drugs, but you could be rest assured we are moving forward and we are definitely moving with a purpose. So no question there. Right. And JP, just to be clear on this, that that uh, initially some of those uh, maybe particularly targeted for people who can't benefit from modulators, at the end of the day, this would be something that could lay the groundwork for a cure for everybody. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, so let's talk about how about the work that's going on sort of for the, for the challenges that people are facing today. We're investing sort of for the future and, and building for that. Talk a little bit about it. What about what about the things people are facing today? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> and just a reminder, you know, many CF complications are not fixed with modulators and therefore they, they continue to need our attention and we still need to continue to develop uh, new treatments and better treatments for those uh, symptoms. And a couple of examples that I'll go through. First is uh, GI symptoms. Um, the CFF is uh, helping to support a program that is developing a new type of enzyme using genetic engineering. Um, we hope this approach will mean a lot less enzyme capsules with meals. We know that most people with CF, despite e even those on modulators, most people still need to take, uh, need to take enzymes. Um, they're in ongoing discussions with the FDA, and we've started to see some of their early protocols and hopefully get those studies started soon. Uh, infections. We know these are still an ongoing challenge for a lot of people with CF. Um, we are supporting several programs um, with all many different unique approaches. And just to remind people, over the last five years, we have invested over $135 million through the Infection Research Initiative, really focused on advancing understanding, treatments, detection of infections. Um, one that you probably heard of, and I'll provide just a little bit of update on, is using phage. And phage is, these are basically viruses that go and attack bacteria, but leave the hosts, us, alone. So we don't get the virus, the bacteria gets the virus. And uh, we are supporting several phage companies, and one uh, did report some early results from a phase one study in people with CF with chronic pseudomonas infection uh, late last year. Uh, the study actually did show reductions in pseudomonas levels during treatment. Um, and on a different front, just last month, we also invested in a company that's developing a novel type of approach to break up something called biofilms, which is just kind of a way that bacteria can grow and be really resistant to antibiotics. And this could potentially uh, restore effectiveness of commonly used antibiotics. So these guys have become resistant. So very excited to see next steps with that program. That's great. And actually, I, it, I'm glad you're able to sort of highlight that we talk about genetic technologies a lot. But there's a whole team that, that focuses on nothing but infection. So yep. Yep. Uh, you're here. Um, I'm going to change the topic on you a little bit just because it's one that I've been hearing a lot about. I know a lot of people are interested. Tell me about mental health work. Uh, this is something we're doing some research. We had a lot of questions about. I know you, this is something you've been thinking a lot about. Can you fill, fill us in there? Yeah, lots going on. And um, it, we are absolutely committed to partnering with community members, care providers, and to really research, recognize, and effectively treat the mental health needs of all people with CF mm -hmm. and their families. And over the past year, I'm really excited about the development of a mental health research working group, very focused just on this topic. And to give it, they're actually, their name is Prime. It's not the other Prime we just talked about, different Prime. And this is prioritizing research in mental health in the modulator era. Um, and they're really charged with identifying, prioritizing, and supporting new research. They've been meeting throughout the year. They had their first kickoff in the fall of last year. And really, um, their group is really uh, focusing on understanding the mental health impacts of CFTR modulators like Trikafta. And on the care side, just a reminder, the foundation financially supports having mental health coordinators in CF care centers and on CF care teams. Um, they're involved in the clinics, helping to identify and in many cases, helping to treat uh, mental health challenges that are faced by people with CF and their families. And Al is going to be joining us in a little bit, but he shared with me that actually some of these treatments are even happening in the CF clinics, which is just amazing. So don't, no question, more work to go, but I feel like we're making some progress on this front. Well, good. Well, JP, thank you. Don't go anywhere. Stay right there. I'm here. We'll no come back to you. And I'm going to move down to the, the next corner of my square here, which is Mary Dwight, uh, our head of policy and advocacy. And so, Mary, let's start with what we did with JP was sort of looking back what we said we were going to do in 2023. How'd we do? Well, I think 2023 was a pretty busy year and a successful year. So 
last year this time, I said I was really excited because we were committed to looking at the experience of CF holistically. So not just the science, all the amazing uh, things that JP just walked us through, which I love hearing about every time. It's, it's fantastic to hear the breadth of that. But I'm excited to share a little bit about what we ch achieved on some of the other fronts. So obviously we know that the foundation's work in research and care is so essential and core to our mission. And we also know, and you and JP just talked a little bit about this with some of the, <clears throat> the daily treatments and the things that we still need to combat, but we know it's so much more than what happens in the CF clinic. And we continue to work to minimize the burden that CF can bring and to think about how we can help people living with CF to also connect with one another, to share their experiences. Um, I think our Compass team is such a great example of how the foundation helps reduce some of the burden of CF. Compass is such an essential collaborator that helps so many people with CF to navigate the complex and really ever-changing insurance landscape. And, and I think we'll mm -hmm. talk about it a little bit, but wow, it was 2023 uh, ever-changing insurance landscape. So just a few numbers for you. During last year's open enrollment, just, uh, just last month, closing last month, Compass assisted more than 700 people with CF with plan comparisons for insurance to help them select the insurance plan that best meets their needs. And overall, Compass received nearly 7,000 requests from the CF community last year, which was an increase of more than 20%. We help people navigate complex insurance coverage cases. We help them find resources to help things like housing and utilities. The breadth of what Compass works with the CF community on is really amazing. <clears throat> and I think it's really important that individual experience that we see encompass in each one of those cases really helps to inform and drive the foundation's policy agenda, which seeks to improve coverage for CF. So through our compass cases, we have a lens into thousands of insurance plans, and we can see what policies help people with CF, as well as the bad practices that impede good CF care. We're making progress here, and we're gonna continue to stay vigilant. And I wanna make sure everyone knows that we work on this both at the national level. So an example there of what we're really advocating and I know many people on the call has helped us with this. We're a leading voice in Washington to help pass the Help All Copays Count Act, which is a really important piece to make I'm sure that people with CF are benefiting from all the therapy therapeutic help they need. And we also to continue to work in state capitals around the country to protect key programs for people with CF and to yeah. pass the hand on disruptive. Can I ask you about that? Actually, I want to ask you some about yeah. that because um, that's one of the things that struck me this past year was how we are oftentimes I think at the national level, but a lot of the work is really done at the state level. And I've seen your team doing that. I've seen the community involved. Talk talk some specifics about the, the, the at the state level uh, this past year. Yeah, the state level was probably even busier than Washington. I, you know, sometimes Washington doesn't uh, get all their work done. Shocking, <laughs> shocking. Um, so we were really active in so many states, and I'd love to give you just a few examples that I think really illustrate the breadth of the work um, and all the different ways we can help people. So I saw a bunch of New Yorkers on in the chat, and they will be familiar with this one. Um, New York has a long uh, standing important adult assistance program that helps support costs for people with CF. And unfortunately, it was eliminated a few years ago. And I'm really proud to say that after a multi year campaign and the work of many, many New Yorkers touched by CF, including several I've seen in the chat, we were success. We successfully reinstated this key program last year. At the very end of the year, it was a Christmas present for everyone. And then another fun example that I think our team is really excited about was because we are hopeful that we can replicate it in other places. Was in California. Also saw some Californians on. California Medicaid announced that they would be creating a list of medications used for the maintenance of chronic conditions like CF that would be eligible for prior authorizations of up to five years. I just wanna say that again, because I think everyone on this call knows what that means. Prior authorizations of five years. So the foundation engaged throughout the year with California Medicaid, and as a result of our engagement, all four CF modulator therapies, as well as many other classes of drugs in the CF care regime, regime are no longer 
need a prior authorization for California Medicaid. That is a huge change. And again, like I said, something we really are trying to work with in other states um, because we know what a difference that makes. So those are just a couple examples of some of the things we were, we were out there doing in 2023. That five years is remarkable. I mean, I think every family, an individual with CF is going to cheer, but also every care team is going to, yeah. there, may not, there may not be as many of them on this, but they're going to cheer as well. So thank you. And then thank you for your team for all. I know how much you guys have been doing hand-to-hand -hand combat in 2023 with states. Um, let's look forward some. What do you see as the real priorities in 2024 that sort of we're going to need the community's help with and the advocacy team's really going to be uh, working on? Yeah, well, the fun thing about policy and advocacy is it really spans the breadth of the foundation's mission. So certainly we will continue to prioritize our efforts to advance CF science and drug development. We'll be pushing aggressively to pass the PASTOR Act. I know so many advocates on that are on this call. That act helps address antimicrobial resistance. So some of the things that you and JP were just talking about and infection. We'll also be working closely with some of the things JP talked about in terms of new trial designs with the FDA. So we're excited about that. And then of course, we will continue to work to protect access to CF therapies by addressing cost and the administrative burdens that we know are too common still for cystic fibrosis things like accumulators, maximizers, and alternative funding programs um, through legislative and regulatory efforts. I think one other thing that we don't talk a lot about, but there's a lot of work that goes on with regulatory agencies, and we've seen some positive change there too. So federally, this means helping to pass that Help All Copays Count Act, and at the state level, passing bans on some of these disruptive programs that shift costs to patients. We also know and have been watching really closely and engaging, as you said, in several states, because some of them have established um, things that are called prescription drug affordability boards. Um, and other states are considering doing these. These boards are responsible for studying the affordability of prescription drugs and assessing whether they are unaffordable for patients and the state's healthcare system. So if a board determines that a drug is unaffordable, the state would have the ability to cap the purchase price of the drug in the state. So as these boards are established, we are watching these processes closely. I will say we are watching them like hawks for their impact on access to CF therapies. And our position is unequivocal. The state and manufacturers that may be subject to a purchase price cap may not take actions that jeopardize access to care for pe people with CF. So we know these are coming down the pike. There was just a bill dropped in Illinois this week that we're commenting on and we'll be meeting with the legislature next week. Um, you know, we've been successful here thus far. We have successfully educated some of these boards about the value of CF care and connected them first and foremost with people with CF and also clinical experts to inform these drug reviews. And as these um, pieces of legislation to establish these programs progress, we'll keep you posted on developments. You'll hear from us if this is happening in your state, and we'd love to engage with you on it. Great. I'm going to ask you one more question, but I was seeing, I'm, I'm at least doing a little bit of looking on the, out of a side eye on the chat. And uh, I, I see the care teams are here, and they say five years are amazing. So that would be a uh, thank you. And um that I also see a lot of interest about diabetes. So we'll have to make sure when we double back on the question, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll lean in on that some. Uh, Mary, last one for you, but I'm gonna change up a little bit from the advocacy. And this is really sort of the reaching out to make sure that we connect with all aspects of the CF community. And um, talk to us a little about some of the work to make sure we sort of engage with people that maybe that the foundation hasn't supported as well before. Yeah, there's some great um, examples of this from 2023 really led by Sue Sullivan and the community partnerships team that are working alongside the community to connect more people with CF. A great example of that is since its launch in 2023, there were 16 requests for a Spanish CF Peer Connect match. 11 of those were made in Spanish and five were made around Hispanic and Latinx identity. So I think that's a great win um, and a community we know we really want to make sure we are connecting with and connecting with each other. Yeah. And the foundation also funded 20 projects designed to engage and support the CF community through the Community Grants Program. 
the impact and community support grants. These funded projects represent a diverse array of services like coaching and discussion groups for young adults with CF navigating life on modulators or online dance and movement classes, which I know a few people who have taken and love. Um, so those kind of classes are available for adults and kids and their family members. There were some cool storytelling workshops. There was support for people returning to work after disability. You know, that was mentioned in the opening video. A connection and education hub for parents of newly diagnosed kids. So lots of really cool projects, all connecting this amazing community with each other and sharing, sharing expertise, sharing resources. So really great examples. Well, thank you, Mary. Don't go, don't go anywhere either. Hang out there. But Al, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna let's start with what we asked with JP and with Mary, and that is uh, the, the hold ourselves accountable part. So as we look back at 2023, so what were some of the things that we really said, hey, we're gonna be working on this and, and how do we do? Well, thanks, Mike, and good evening, everyone. At our 2023 national annual meeting, our clinical affairs team said, we were excited about evolving our care model with six multi-center studies underway. Now, I know familiar to everyone on the call, but just as a reminder that the the current CF care model is tried and true. It has served people with CF well for decades and a model for other chronic diseases. We all know it consists of four clinic visits per year with a specialized multidisciplinary team where lung function, nutritional status, airway cultures, among others, are routinely evaluated. However, that's solely looking at it from the surface. The CF care model is so much more, including evidence-based care driven by data and guidelines, delivered holistically with a focus on the person and family, not just the lungs or the GI tract, resulting in co-production of care within the framework of trusting relationships. These are essential components that not only do we want to retain, but we want to continue to grow and improve. Now, there are two groups working on guidance documents around the care model and team structure and we anticipate these documents will be out by the end of the year. To help inform those papers, a survey with some 1,300 participants from both the community and providers. So some of you in the audience, and thank you for those of you that completed these surveys, so that we could better understand from you how care should be adapted to better suit your needs. The six studies that we've mentioned focus on remote monitoring or testing, specifically PFTs and airway cultures, telehealth and mobile apps. And they're all important in increasing our understanding whether key components of care delivery can be done from a person's home rather than from clinic, all the while never causing any harm and making sure we maintain or improve healthcare outcomes, always with the goal of meeting each individual's needs. Several studies are actively enrolling and we look forward to any CFC to hear some preliminary results. That's great. So uh, definitely progress, but more to go. That sounds great. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you a different question, which is everyone's excited about uh, individuals with CF living longer than ever before, but it also is sort of a new world, right? Uh, starting to learn new things. People are living longer. Maybe there's some new challenges. I've been asked a lot about, okay, what's, what are we doing to try to make sure that people still are healthy as they get older with CF? Can you talk a little bit about this aging with, you know, the aging with CF? Uh, what, what are we doing about that? Yeah, you know, I love hearing those words. It brings a smile to my face. Aging with CF. Not no complexities. But I grew up at a time, and Mike, so did you, where aging with CF meant a successful transition from a pediatric to an adult program. And, you know, I, I, I still remember every child that I had the honor to care for that didn't get to do that. Mm. So first, what a blessing to really talk about aging with CF. Now, our aim is for each individual with CF to live the longest, healthiest lives possible. And therefore, we're identifying the complexities and heightened risks that are present in aging with CF in comparison to aging without CF. We know that there are elevations in risks for certain cancers like colon or for CF-related diabetes, liver disease, renal disease, bone health, to name a few. And then on top of that, conditions we previously didn't associate with people with CF, such as high cholesterol levels or coronary vascular disease or obesity, are now actual concerns. We're actively looking into these areas and considering approaches 
to ensure providers are tailoring care to the unique needs of individuals with CF. And relatively recently, we engaged a group of experts to provide the care community, and, and these were published, guidance around approaches to nutrition. For most, the traditional taking as many calories as you can just is not appropriate anymore. And it's also now necessary, as I mentioned, to follow cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Now, as part of the evolving CF care model, a lot of thought is being given to how the non-pulmonary aspects of aging with CF are addressed, and multiple approaches are on the table. But essentially, we're considering how to have primary care providers knowledgeable in CF partnering care. And then equally important for people aging with CF are addressing sexual and reproductive health, mental health concerns, chronic pain, and more. And we have groups working in all these areas, either in active research, providing guidance, or implementing guideline recommendations in the clinic. Now, one area that we want to try and learn more about very quickly is cancer. And we're purposefully collecting cancer information through our patient registry. As, as we learn, it is vital that people with CF undergo routine screening, such as colonoscopies, beginning at age 40, with rescreening every five years, if not a transplant recipient. If a transplant recipient, you begin at 30 years of age. Now, we are supporting a study to see if stool-based testing, it's called NICE-CF, is just as good as colonoscopy, so stay tuned for that. That's great. I'm seeing in the comments here and from Sue Sullivan, who used to be a nurse, one of my nurses at Hopkins, there was those days we used to say, on your way home from clinic, stop at Burger King and then McDonald's. And actually, she was saying, I can't believe we used to hand out gift cards to fast food. So uh, we, we're, we're getting better. We can, we, can, we can do better than that. So, uh, Al, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. So we've been talking about aging with CF, but there's also some things that we need to get right with newborns, right? At the time of diagnosis and making sure that we do that efficiently and get people right plugged in with the best care. You, this, you and Mary have both been spending a lot of energy on this. Can you talk to us about this whole getting patients or new infants diagnosed uh, in a timely manner? We have. This, this is an exciting initiative here at the at the foundation. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Many research studies over the decades have demonstrated that newborn screening CF has been transformational for children. It's it's a remarkable story, and it's it is a cause for celebration. And yet at the same time, we have to continually ask ourselves, can we do better? And are we leaving anyone behind? Now, universal screening was implemented in 2010 in the US for CF. Unfortunately, there isn't a universal approach to screening. It's not a federal program. We have 50 states and we have 39 different algorithms. Now, do you think they all perform equally? Spoiler alert, they don't. Newborn screens by testing the blood for a couple of things. One, one thing is looking to see if the baby carries one of the more common CF mutations. The problem is that people of color are more likely to carry rare mutations that don't appear on a state screening test. The result is that these babies do not equitably benefit from newborn screening nationwide. So addressing this issue is one of our top priorities. We implemented an initiative in a multidisciplinary committee of experts, including our very best experts, parents who have lived experience, and we're, they're developing guideline recommendations so that evidence can define the best approach. Now, the initiative also includes funding of screening improvement programs where the state lab and CF care centers are working together to improve newborn screening. Lastly, this initiative, as you pointed out, is a partnership between clinical affairs and policy and advocacy, and together, we have developed an advocacy strategy to partner with state lab directors once the guidelines are completed. So perfect. Um, it, it is, I think, uh, it highlights all the different journeys that people are having, right? So uh, we've talked about old, we've talked about young. Let me talk about one other one, and I know one that's close to your heart because you've been so involved in that, and that is lung transplant. So uh, you've personally been involved with this, both in, as a physician and now as leading a program for quality improvement. Talk a little bit about the work that we're doing to try to improve the outcomes after lung transplantation. Yeah, so we continue to actively fund research in chronic lung allograft dysfunction, 
which uh, for short is clad in its manifestation of chronic rejection. And just a few weeks ago, we hosted a full day conference with the experts in CLAD to plan out our next steps. The group included leadership from the NIH. And as a result of the conference, we have a meeting scheduled with the FDA to begin to partner and discuss with them what would an acceptable study design, what outcome measures would they accept for testing possible therapeutic targets to treat or prevent CLAD? We're not there yet, but we want to lay that groundwork now. We're also funding a study to analyze data already present from lung transplant programs within our consortium. So remember, we have a consortium of 15 large CF lung transplant programs to see if repurposing a drug that's actually used in diabetes in a small single center study that appeared to, in, in that small single center study, appeared to show very promising results. Let's see what it is in, in this larger cohort. And lastly, I'll mention that we're collaborating with scientists and the NIH to explore a potentially large study that would evaluate the benefit of a drug in preventing CLAD if taken from the time of transplant. Bottom line is we want to help every person living with CF, including those who've undergone lung transplant and may be battling CLAD. Great. Well, thank you, Al. You don't go anywhere, go anywhere else either. We're going to double back with them. I'm sure that we'll probably get some more questions about transplant. Uh, I actually want to ask JP one last question uh, that came up as I was thinking that we talked about trying to reach uh, as many people as, as broadly in the community as possible. But one of the things that I know you've been working on is specifically in clinical trials, trying to engage as broad uh, a group as possible. Talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go into questions. Yeah, no, happy to. And thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, we've we been thinking quite a, quite a lot about how to engage uh, people who perhaps have not had opportunities to be in clinical trials of late. And if you think about it, and over the last 10 years, there have been an awful lot of research studies involving CFTR modulators. Well, what does that mean? People who are not modulator eligible have not been able to participate in clinical trials. And so to some extent, we got to do some work to make sure we're really engaging with this group so that they can help we uh, benefit from the, uh, the the variety of genetic-based therapies that I was describing before. So to kind of help with that process, we are kicking off a study that's called REACH, and big surprise, it's geared towards reaching these people <laughs> to participate in clinical trials. And the idea really is to have them enroll in a clinical trial that is, it's just observational. You know, there's, there's no new therapy, no new treatment, but we're getting the data in a very sort of a rigorous way, very much like a clinical trial. And the hope is that this, uh, these people participating in this uh, sort of open label, or I guess you would say observational study, that data may actually be able to be applied to some of the later phase studies of genetic-based therapies. We understand that doing these studies, uh, the, the, one of the challenges is we just don't have a whole lot of uh, people to enroll in these studies. We just, we just don't, it's a numbers problem. And if we could really optimize um, having a sort of a control group that could be used to be compared across a bunch of different programs, we think we could support a whole lot more uh, attempts to sort of restore CFTR function. So keep an eye out for the REACH study. Again, we, and we see it starting in the middle of this year. And uh, again, uh, designated specifically for people who are not able to take modulators. Perfect. Thank you. All right, let's go to Q&A. Uh, and actually, I'm going to say if we need to, we might even go a little bit past nine because I would like to be able to hit people's questions. And uh, I'm going to go through, but uh, JP, while I've got you, maybe I'll start with one that came in that was specifically talking about sort of the next generation uh, of CFTR modulators. So uh, we've sure. right from have been great. What, what, what's the future hold? Where are we with that? What's, yeah. what's ahead? Yeah. Two things to really uh, highlight, I would say. Uh, first thing is there is a next generation um, version of Trikafta that's actually just finished its uh, uh, year long clinical trial. It's actually gone down to age six. And this is a once daily preparation. Uh, it's uh, two out of the three uh, drugs are different than what's in Trikafta. There's certainly similarities, but there are, there are different drugs. One's called Vanzacaptor. There's also Tezacaptor and then something called Dudacaptor. And long story short, it's a once a day preparation. The, the, the data from the lab suggests it might be even more effective. We'll find that out with the clinical trial, but that study is done and we're actually waiting to hear results. So super excited about that. 
uh, on a different front, uh, a company named Siona actually uh, recently, I think it might have even been today, um, um, highlighted that uh, they are in the, in taking on an, an additional study in healthy volunteers. Siona, this company, is developing modulators, but the interesting thing about them is they're different. In other words, they're fundamentally different molecules than what is available now for people with CF. Why is that important? Because we think that if there are side effects related or lack of response, this is another way to potentially restore function to CFTR. And it may apply even to some of those rare variants that don't work with uh, the currently available ones. So keep an eye out for that company. We're very excited about them. You know, they're in, they're in non-CF studies, but they are gearing up for CF studies very soon. It's great. I'm just going to add an answer in live time. One of the things that came by is, are we seeing less side effects of these new drugs? And the answer is, I think it's a little early. We're really paying attention on this. That's the hope uh, for some of these. We would love to, but it's going to be a, a little earlier, though. We're, it's not that far. In the next year or so, we should know a lot more. Uh, maybe one more for you, JP, and then Al and Mary, get ready. Sure. Uh, JP, one talked about pregnancy. This is a great one. What's Is there research that's happening related to pregnancy and CF? Um, please. Yeah. Well, away. You may remember that uh, pregnancy is about tripled <laughs> the year after triple therapy became available, and uh, I think the uh, the baby boom continues. Um, in response to that, uh, with uh, leaders in the field, we developed a study called Mayflowers, and Mayflowers is really focused on understanding the pregnancy experience, both uh, for, for the pregnant mother, the family, but also the maternal and fetal outcomes of people uh, with CF who are pregnant. And it's looking, at, as you might guess, at looking pe at people who are treated with uh, Trikapta. It's also looking at people who choose not to be on Trikapta. It's looking at levels. It's looking at breast milk levels. It's looking at levels in uh, the babies. And so it's really looking comprehensively at how Trikapta impacts pregnancy and outcomes. And uh, that study, they've enrolled almost 300 people. So it is kicking. <laughs> And so, um, yeah, kicking in many ways. So um, yeah, exactly, uh, small legs kicking, small feet kicking, and actually, I know I saw a doctor, Dr. Taylor Kauser, who I, think I saw her name on here, is actually a, a key lead here on the Mayflowers work and a member of our board. So I have no doubt that's going to be going full speed ahead. All right, uh, question number three we have here is: Is there an interest from the CF Foundation to grow towards global impact? Are there any pr programs to help people with CF in other countries and this is a great one. I love this question because people may not know how much we're doing and other things, but actually, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one to Al and to Mary. Al, do you want to kick it off and uh, fill us in? Yeah, happy to do so. Uh, we've been funding for the past several years uh, and working together with several U.S. CF programs that have been visiting low and middle income countries in South America, as well as in the Middle East, teaching them and helping them build multidisciplinary teams. So taking that tried and true care model and bringing it to other healthcare systems and other countries. And the, the result, I've really been impressed myself to see how concentrations on infection prevention and control and nutrition and airway clearance make such a huge impact and difference. So it's, it's, training these programs to build these multidisciplinary teams and then putting in that evidence-based guideline care make a huge difference in outcomes for people with CF in, in these low and middle income countries. That's great. Uh, Mary. Yeah, I can just add a little bit that, um, you know, I, it's, it's fun to be able to share a little bit about what we do do internationally and um, to pile on to what Al was just talking about, I think really in, in the space that I work in, it's a lot of collaboration. Uh, we work with entities like the UK CF Trust, CF Canada, CF Australia, CF Europe, where we're sharing best practices, we're sharing strategies, we're talking advocacy, we're talking about engagement, and we're also working on a lot of study design together. Um, one thing that has really shined was um, during the COVID pandemic, we did a collaboration across multiple CF organizations and CF registries to better have a, have a quicker insight into how COVID was impacting people with CF using that global registry network. So a great indication of how we're really working around the globe together. And we're also working a lot on some of the things I talked about around supporting people with CF in other ways beyond the clinic. 
um, sharing program design. Um, we actually have a lot of collaborations on studies to understand uh, the impact of things like cost and coverage for people with CF all around the globe. We're using common questions to make sure that we really see a global trend and understand the kinds of programs and the kind of advocacy that we're going to need to do. So lots going on in the global space that we yeah. don't so thanks for the question. I'm glad to be able to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, and maybe the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll pile on here is that people may not know that we really are the main supporter of all the clinical trial networks around the world. And this is because new therapy development now is it's a global effort, right? We can go faster, have more enrollment. So that includes the clinical trial network in Europe, includes the CTAP or the, the, the clinical trial in UK. So uh absolutely some global aspect there. All right, total change now. We're going to move down the body to the pancreas. There's a there's a whole bunch of different pancreas related questions here. Uh, maybe we'll start with the ones that we saw in the chat earlier, which was really just sort of what's what's the newest on on diabetes. Uh I, I don't know, maybe I'll ask JP to talk about bionic pancreas. Isn't that such a great name? I mean, I think I don't know, it makes me think of uh if I say Lee Majors, does anybody remember that Absolutely. name? Absolutely, it, it tells how old you are. But the bionic, bionic man, exactly. All right, there you go. Now, anyway, um, so bionic pancreas is uh, an exciting idea. Basically, it's it's basically a, like a closed loop between um, an insulin pump and your uh, continuous glucose monitor. So when your when your sugar goes up, your blood glucose goes up, you automatically adjust that with the pump. And uh, there's been some really exciting work with this in type one diabetes, you know, somewhat different than CF, but um, very exciting work. And so we are, uh, we are in the starting up phase of a clinical trial of the bionic pancreas for people with CF and CFRD. And uh, this work is uh, getting off the ground this year. We're sort of in the getting the sites on board and starting up uh, as we speak. So um, I don't know if I'll have results for you this time next year, but not too far after that. So a lot of working very hard on that and really excited to offer perhaps a, a whole new way to manage diabetes. Yeah, because the, the take-home message there would be, it would be automatically monitored and then automatically adjust the insulin release. Right? Exactly. So it's, exactly. Yeah. There's even Great. another layer when they, they actually put in another, another hormone called glucagon. That one's not quite ready for prime time, but conceptually this, this whole idea is going to continue to advance over the next coming years. Yeah. Um, that um, I think there's also a question here that was specifically related to uh, sort of the non-endocrine, whatever, and pan pancreatic enzymes. Yeah. Is it going to be possible to actually, are we developing, I think you mentioned this a little bit. And then another one, and maybe this is an Al, an Al question uh, on the clinician side as well, would just be, is it is it likely that we're going to be able for somebody who's on enzymes now to be able to completely restore their ability they're in, you know, not needing to take enzymes anymore. Is that, you know, so maybe two, two parts to that since we're covering the pancreas. Um, so I don't know, uh, do you want to, Al, you want to start with this question of if you're taking enzymes, are we going to be able to come up with something that they no longer need to take enzymes? So it, it may very well be somewhat age related. Um, so it is possible that younger children starting mm -hmm. on these highly effective modulator therapies may be able to come off. And in fact, I know that there have been some parents who've come and told me that their children have been able to come off. Um, and then there's also exciting news uh, around infants who've been born uh, with CF uh, to moms um, with CF uh, and uh, have not needed enzyme replacement therapy. However, for those who are uh, older, have more advanced uh, pancreatic scarring, it's unlikely that that um, just being on modulators will be enough and that uh, they would need to continue their uh, enzyme replacement therapy. Yeah, that makes sense. And so because of that continued, we if you've been on the enzymes for years and years and you're older, then unfortunately that we're not gonna be able to get that back at least with anything that we have close. And that, so that was the idea of trying to get better enzymes. So JP, you wanna mention just one more time, I, th I think you mentioned this earlier, if I recall that, that uh, we're doing some research around actually trying to develop a newer enzyme? Yeah, yeah, it's a, basically using sort of genetic engineering to have the enzymes grown up in essentially in bacteria, which is a kind of a, sounds weird, but it's kind of a way to make drugs actually that's, uh, it can be much more purified. And uh, really the idea here is to have a much more effective type of enzyme. It can sort of, you know, get activated at the right time. It's uh, some of the problems with uh, 
the uh, current enzymes, you know, it's challenge of sort of passing through your stomach in an acidic environment and then need to be sort of out of the stomach to get activated. And anyway, long story short, this is hopefully uh, to uh, overcome some of those challenges and hand in hand with that, but just less, you know, I mean, you know, enzymes are a mouthful. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's so this, the, the theory might, might be able to take one, one yeah, pill. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Eight pill as opposed to a handful. So this, you know, I'm, I think we're really excited about that. That's great. Um, I think this there's a question on here that says uh, that in the next year, as a foundation, thinking about ways to make adults with CF feel more included now that there's so many more in-person gatherings post-COVID. I think this is a good challenge for us, right, in many ways. And I'm not sure I'm going to have a perfect answer, but I can tell you what we've been thinking about. So certainly one of the things we learned during COVID was the ability to use virtual in a lot of ways. And we've been thinking about ways of trying to, in CFF events, always say, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that adults or teens or whatever with, with CF can feel like they can participate? Uh, there's um, So some of that's using technology. I, I think we, we we commonly receive questions about what about the infection control part? And I, we actually did visit this with some of our experts. And I think right now we're, we're not at a place where we say, hey, we're ready to change infection control guidelines, even with the modulators. And that's because there's still uh, some of those risks. But we're actually looking at this and there's some research that's going on to try to help better understand that. So probably in the near future, it's using technology in ways that we haven't uh, in the past and that we've learned about how to do. I don't know, That's if you guys have anything else you wanna add on that one, uh, feel free, but. Uh, uh, Mike, I can just add, as you said, we, we, we do have a group of experts actually revisiting um, IPC, not not within the clinical setting, so that's important, but uh, among the these sorts of events. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, I'm looking through these. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting closer on time. So uh, this question says, is gene therapy envisioned to be a fundamental alteration of all the genes in the body such that all in oh so that all inherited genes to the next generation oh I see so I, they're asking two things here one is it how many cells are affected but also would it get passed on yeah. um, JP you want to take that one sure uh, the short answer is no <laughs> so um, it's, no to passing on right yeah um, not passing yeah. on and not every cell in your body um, so great question though but um, yeah what when we think about gene therapy whichever sort of approach you take. Um, the uh, the goals really are to target the organs affected by CF. And um, this we believe this is going to start with the lung. That's certainly where most of the work is going on now, but certainly thinking about how we could also deliver these genes to those cells in your body that need them. Um, at this time, though, um, you know, there's really no consideration that we would, you know, change sort of the germ cells or the reproductive cells of people. So I don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but talk about sort of uh, that level of genetic based therapy. I think we'd be really seeking to deal with uh, the, the other organ manifestations. And um, uh, again, and, and for sort of at least the foreseeable future, we think it's probably going to be involving pulmonary therapies or helping to address the lung problems. Those would not be passed on to other people or other generations. Great, thank you. Um, so we're getting to the top. There was Mary's. There's a there's a hodgepodge of ones for you, Mary. So um, I think um, one of the ones was a specific one I saw was actually. Can you give us just a couple of lines specifically what happened in Colorado about the? Because uh, I think a lot of people were watching that one as an example. I don't know if you want to give a couple of lines on that. All right, I'll try to be fast. So Colorado was really first out of the gate with this prescription drug advisory board. Uh, standing theirs up and, and getting underway. Trikafta was one of five drugs that they evaluated with the question of, is the drug unaffordable? The bottom line answer is they said, no, it is not unaffordable. And yes, that's a double negative and that's how it came down. And the result of that was that Trikafta is no longer being considered by the state of Colorado for this process. So they're continuing on with four other drugs and we'll probably get to a point of trying to have price caps for those drugs, but Trikafta is not one of the ones proceeding to that process. And I want to tell you why. Um, this, as I said, first out of the gate, this is a new process and there's a lot of learning to, that still has to be done as these kinds of things progress. 
I think in this case, we don't want to be a guinea pig. Um, and we really worked hard to make sure that the state of Colorado and this board understood what CF is, what Trikafta is for the CF community. And that was done through the really artful and thoughtful voices of people with CFs sharing their experiences. And also a lot of great work from the entire care team um, at both the adult and uh, pediatric centers in Colorado, who spent a lot of time testifying. You can see all of this information and how the foundation engaged and a lot of the comments and information that we shared with the state on our website, if you are so inclined um, to read and read a lot of that information. And there's more on the website also about these prescription drug advisory boards, just so you can get up to speed if it's something you're interested in. Perfect. Thank you. I know there's there's a lot of questions. I'm uh, I'm going to probably say what I'm going to say is say come come to VLC. We would love to talk to you and answer these questions in person. You can pick any one of these or some other people, and we'd love to to uh, engage with you and, and and answer your questions in detail. I think the other thing is I've seen in the chat. Thank you, Susan, uh, and others who have been sort of adding to to answer as we go. We'll try to also make sure that we. Uh, uh, Post these to support. I want to thank our our our. I want to thank you guys uh, tonight for your uh, for for uh, the, the the thoughtfulness and your answers and also all your work. Uh, so excited about 2024. So if you guys want to step off, I'll probably uh, wish everybody a good night and then we'll uh, we'll wrap. So thank you guys. Um, so hopefully you got a feel for why I said there's a lot to be. Uh, excited about and hopeful about for 2024, as well as uh, 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 grateful for uh, a great team. And we specifically tried to sort of change up some of the faces. And you know, there's a whole bunch of other people who are working just as hard on many of these topics. And uh, so much to be grateful for. One thing I'm absolutely grateful for is for the CF community, for all of you. So thank you for being our partners in this work. We're going to need, we have a lot of work to do. There's one other thing I wanted to do before we close tonight. It's one of the reasons why I thought we could wrap up some of the questions. And that was, I wanted to take actually a moment to recognize and honor another special group of partners in this effort. And that's those who we've lost to CF, right? Not just in the past year, but through all the years. And whether children or sisters or brothers or parents or friends, we know that there's so many in our community who have paid the ultimate sacrifice to this disease. Uh, but they simultaneously inspired us and they've pushed us ahead. So I actually wanted us to take a moment to, to quietly call to mind someone who we've lost, that you've lost to CF, who's special to each of us, and to be grateful for them. So just take a minute to do that. I think the part that's remarkable is unfortunately there's a lot of people that come to mind. I think probably certainly for me and probably for many of us, but we are grateful for how they've pushed us. And um, there, there's also one other person I wanted to uh, to uh, call out and have us call to mind really in some way this evening. And that's not someone who's had CF, but someone who's made an incredible difference. We wouldn't be telling the story that we're telling tonight has made an incredible difference in the lives of people with CF everywhere in our fight against CF. And that is our friend and philanthropic leader, Joe O'Donnell who passed away just a few weeks ago after a serious illness. And uh, you probably know, but Joe and his wife, Kathy, dedicated themselves to advancing our CF mission for four decades in honor of their son, Joey, who died from CF in 1986 and had every reason to leave, but stuck and continue to make a difference. Joe served as the chairman of the foundation's Milestones Major Gift Campaigns, right? And here's the amazing thing. Over the course of his life, he raised almost basically over a half a billion dollars, over $500 million for CF research. And without him, we wouldn't have these CFTR modulator medicines that we're talking about. So, um, you know, to accelerate to genetic therapies, which was his next uh, thing that he was really excited about, Joe had stepped up to lead our third campaign in 2020, Milestones 3, and with a goal of raising $200 million uh, by the end of this year. And so, so far we're at 150 million, we're moving ahead. But tonight, we just wanted to honor Joe's legacy as just an incredible champion for all people living with CF. And I know that Joe would think the best way to honor his legacy is for us to continue to push ahead, to move with laser focus, absolute determination in pursuit of these new treatments, the best CF care, and, and absolutely that cure for all people with CF. And 
I know that together we are going to get there. So I just want to thank you again for spending time this evening uh, together, uh, for joining us, for your making a difference in CF. I really can't wait to see the progress that we're going to make together in 2024 and look forward to seeing you in person.